Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the webinar, Housing Development Using Land Bank Tools. Uh, we'll get started in a moment here. I have Jim Tischler with me and we'll do an introduction, but I'll give people a minute to, uh, to roll in. Okay, it looks like people are rolling in. Um, so hopefully you're in the right place if you had this link. Uh, this is a webinar about housing development using land bank tools. My name is Yarrow Brown. I'm the executive director of Housing North. With our housing supply in crisis, it's important to utilize as many tools as possible to create housing opportunities and to work with our partners across all sectors. In our region, we're fortunate to have some existing tools, including our county and state land bank authorities, and are looking at ways to combine these tools and other resources for future housing projects. We're really fortunate to have Jim Tischler, the development director of the Michigan State Land Bank Authority, to explain how communities can use the state land bank and local land banks for development and the resources available to con continue developing affordable housing. Land Bank 2.0 is a word you might have heard us throw around and it's a new tool we're bringing to our communities to help provide more affordable and attainable housing for the long term. Before I turn it over to Jim, I wanted to remind you to leave questions in the Q&A or the chat um, and we should, be able, we should be able to use the chat to communicate with each other as well. If we can't get to your question today we'll, um, during this webinar, we'll try to answer them afterwards and we'll send a follow-up email with a copy of the presentation and the recorded webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us today, and I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Thanks for being here, Jim. Okay, thanks, Jero, and uh, good morning, everybody. Happy New Year, and happy Friday. Nice to have a chance to connect up with you all again. Um, I'm a winter person by uh, by nature, and so uh, I'm, I always uh, have desire to want to uh, engage and be with folks in the northern regions, because this time of year, there's plenty of snow and plenty of things to do out in that snow. So hopefully you'll have a chance to enjoy that this weekend after you hear this presentation. I'm gonna um, move to share my screen here with Yarrow's help. Uh, and I think it should be up here right now. As we get prepared to run this presentation, I'll uh, give a look, just a slight background. Uh, some of you uh, may have been in the, uh, in the audience back in the fall when I was in uh, Leelanau County providing this presentation. So those of you who that were in that session, you'll see some familiar slides, uh, but uh, at request of a number of other uh, participants, other folks, I have, uh, we have added a few additional slides because some of the questions coming out of that late fall uh, presentation discussion was, how can we actually get to thinking about doing these types of projects? So you'll see a little bit of, of additional Kind of advancing elements of how you have how we connect these tools uh, to actually to perform develop affordable housing or attainable housing um, on land bank owned properties whether they are in existing inventory uh, and, uh, or they could come into inventory now one other quick uh, step up to get ready here is that you in Leelanau county you have an excellent land bank uh, in the county land bank i've talked to john and Trudy and the, and, the, and the crew there uh, a number of times about projects. So it's our hope uh, as a state land bank that we can be of tactical, technical support to the Leelanau Land Bank in, in you, uh, engaging in some of these projects. And for those of you who are in counties in Northwest Michigan who may not have land banks, rest assured you do have a land bank. It is the state land bank. And we have under uh, a statute and charge the mission to operate across the state. So. Whether you have a count, good county service like Leonot or not, these tools can be brought to play in your jurisdiction to provide affordable or attainable housing on land bank properties. So this slide presentation is going to run about 20, 22 slides. Um, you are welcome to put chat. I think you're going to monitor the presentation here. And we've left plenty of time afterwards to have Q&A. Uh, because that's where I find, and I'm sure you might be thinking, that's where really got, getting into some specific areas would be highly beneficial. And we, I agree, I would like to have that conversation with y'all. So let's get started. Um, and I'll start with a, a couple of baseline slides to set the stage. Again, these were same as I showed a few months ago up there, but and, and they may be a little dated, meaning now it's 2022 but they have absolute relevancy. 
Uh, and it sets the stage for why we're here, why we need to look at this and, and new collaborative uh, in, uh, integration of tools as what we're, we're proposing. This slide, this, this graph was produced by the St. Louis Federal Reserve Economic uh, Data Outfit. They do all the national economic research for the Federal Reserve System. This charge, uh, chart was produced last year. Um, and there is a lot of research. There is a lot of cause, there are rationale in terms of cause as to why we are in a housing crisis today. Um, we can talk about that in multiple other sessions. For today, I felt it was important for you just to see what the absolute numbers are at a national level and across time. So starting from, you can see earlier in the 20th century to the present time and projected out through uh, um, least squares analysis here, you're looking at national numbers, the comparison of the average median cost or price of a home, that's the orange or maybe yellow in your uh, presentation, that's the yellow line, and the green line, which is the median national household income. Two things become very clear, that uh, the, the gap is widening between the cost of housing and the ability of households to purchase or, or conversely, or you can assume rent as well. I don't think there's anything you didn't know. In your neck of the woods, wherever neck of the woods it is across the state, this is an issue which is known and being, being and, and understood and hence the need uh, to address the crisis. But what also is important, I haven't shown this slide, I've got it back deep in the slide deck, is this percentage of income necessary to afford a house. And that chart is going up too, and it's closing in on 500%. In other words, 500% of an average median income is in most markets, the likely determinant of whether you can afford housing or not. And that too is growing, uh, not exponentially, but dramatically over time. This defines uh, where we are, the crisis and the need to respond. This slide also was a baseline uh, stage setter that we used last time. Because there's, dependent upon your program, federal, state, local program, dependent upon the expert or per person, your people we are talking about, talking to and with, there is a differentiation of thought or opinion about what we mean by affordable housing. I present this slide not to, to be the definitive uh, this is what it is, but more to give you a sense to what we are wanting to talk about in this presentation and in assistance to Leland and other counties, which is that area of attainable housing. Okay, but I want to start by on the far left of the slide to identify and give you a sense of where programs apply for what households at what AMI or percentage or what area median income level they are as household. That's what that acronym is, which is the bottom. Um, area median income. So at the far left from zero to 30%, uh, that dark blue area, that square, that range of the market, of any market, is generally eligible for public housing or vouchers if though if those such units or such vouchers are available. The next strata is from 30 to 60% of area median income. And that strata, but also below that, that's what you can see at the bottom of that graph, you can see the me medium blue line actually running underneath the dark blue square. That's intended to show that the range of eligibility for low income housing tax credits, that's what the LIHTC or LIHTC acronym is, that that range is from zero to 60% of, of area median income. The next strata, which runs from 60 to 80% of area median income, and, but also extends to zero, as you can see in the graphic, are households which would be eligible uh, for either or there, but primarily this is where the home and the community development block grant, the CDBG programs operate. Again, not exclusively, but relatively, this is the structure of how federal funding, federal programs, assist housing, right? Now, let's go over to the far right of this slide, where it's at 120% or higher area median income. The, there is no program to provide for those households because they can afford housing and uh, they can afford to purchase, they can afford the rent. 
That's why they're market rate units and that market functions. But this gap, which is defined in the orange square between, or maybe the light yellow square between the two, which is 80 to 120% area median income is where the crunch is. Actually, the crunch is across the board from 120 south down to zero, but 80 to 120 is in the, what we call the attainable. You may have heard the phrase workforce. That's what we're talking about. And the, the dilemma is not just that there's no lack of supply um, and that there's a gap between uh, incomes and, uh, and costs as, we as, as I showed in an earlier slide, but it's that there, there is a dearth of programmatic support for those households to assist them, right? Uh, and for uh, presentation purposes today, uh, the green numbers below that graphic of $52,199 to $78,299, that range is the 2020 area median income range of 8120 for Leelanau County. Now it's, it's updated on an annual basis. So there'll be new data coming out shortly, but you can look at that number if you're, our, if you're a, a, a public official or citizen in Leland County and you can say, okay, households between those two numbers are in that box or in that scenario. And they generally might not necessarily be able to qualify for federal funding programs, but they don't have necessarily enough income to afford housing. And again, maybe your actual numbers in terms of the rally in the field is different. That's a key component of the gap that land banks using tax increment financing can have an effect. And that is where we have been for, uh, for the past three years, starting with research and then teaching and training, and now starting with practice with communities uh, such as Leland Land Bank and other counties within the Northwest Michigan region, region two. So I'm hopeful that that I spent a lot of time on that slide, but I wanted to have you get a baseline understanding so that we can proceed to get into more. Now, another baseline, excuse me, another baseline slide. Um, we're gonna talk about tax increment financing. And I'm sure a number of you understand tax increment financing, but some of you may not. And so this slide and other uh, uh, slides I'll showing, be showing today are, uh, will hopefully set an understanding foundation for you of what TIF is. And I chose to choose a graphic uh, with, and annotate the graphics so that it's a visual presentation um, because words are good, but sometimes words don't convey understanding as well as images do. So let's dive into this slide as well. What you have here is a, a graph which has value on the on the on the y-axis. Let me back up. I just jumped ahead on the y-axis here, uh, and uh, time on the x-axis. This is the horizontal axis. Um, what's in purple here is intended to show a property. It could be any property. We'll talk about land bank properties in a moment. It could be any property, but that property has a base assessed and taxable value on it. Okay, um, and that and that stays that stays as base. The concept of tax increment financing is this, that there might be one or more public purpose needs in a area, in a district, in a corridor, in a project, on a property, and that there, there is a gap to need to cover that cost, which is not ordinary to normal, the extraordinary cost. It's a cleanup of the site. It's infrastructure to support the corridor or the neighborhood, something of that realm. That if a, a approval is merited that allows for from new investment on that property in that district, in that corridor, in that neighborhood, that is incremental after an investment of the cost is made. So in other words, if I have to spend $200,000 to clean up a site, but I'm gonna put a $4 million building on that property, that the difference between the base value, say the property originally was $50,000 value, and the new value, $400,000, that $350,000, that's called incremental value. And that for a period of time, that incremental value is captured temporarily. It's captured and redirected to pay for or reimburse the costs necessary to support or to allow for the project or the investment to occur. So back to the concept of a brownfield site for the moment, if it's a $200,000 cleanup to, to help make a $4 million building be built, 
that that increment is used over time as necessary and only to the limit that the $200,000 plus interest is re reimbursed. So what you're seeing here in this graphic is as the increased value goes, that that is captured to pay for those activities until such a time that the costs are paid. And when the costs are paid, then the, the plan ends. There is no more increment captured and the new that property project value investment reverts to paying all of the taxing jurisdictions, local and state, the, uh, the increase in taxes based upon the increase in revenue. So you can think of TIF as a temporary, in this case, a temporary capture of, of value to allow for reimbursement of extra earning costs, which are defined as eligible activities. The base value while this, while this process is going continues to pay everybody. This is only a capture of the incremental value, what's in the yellow or perhaps light orange in your, in your view uh, there as well. That's an important additional consideration. It, I mentioned this, I'll say it again, that it returns the property to the tax roll at the end of the term. So it's a limited term capture. Um, sometimes this is called project-based or parcel-based TIF, <coughs> excuse me. And we'll, uh, I'll explain that further um, uh, in, in this presentation or with the uh, Okay, now that we have some baseline understandings set, we can dive a little deeper into what, how these two tools come together. And by the two tools, what I mean is the, uh, what's known as the Brown for Development Financing Act, TIF Financing Act or Act 381. We like to call it the Redevelopment TIF Act. Um, that was adopted in 1996. There's some detail summary on the slide here for you. That act allowed for the creation of local authorities and Leona County has a Brown for Redevelopment Authority. Um, your, the mission of the BRA is in the right, upper right of this square or this slide, which is to investigate, clean up, limit blight and return properties to productive use. That's the key phrase, it's in their mission. The law allows for municipalities such as counties to create authorities and to allow those authorities to operate primarily for the purpose of financing the reimbursement of eligible activities on eligible property. Now there's a little more detail to that, a lot more detail in terms of practice, but at core, that's what Act 381 redevelopment or Brown Redevelopment authorities do. The Land Bank Act, which was adopted in 2003, established the mechanism for counties to create land banks. Lillana County has a land bank. Its mission is in the lower right of this slide. And if, which is to enhance tax base by returning tax reverted, but any property to tax rolls and the partner with community stakeholders to acquire and redevelop undervalued properties to support workforce housing and economic development. Well, it's interesting to see those missions as Trudy and I have talked a number of times, there is a distinct and direct intent to link these two missions because these two operations, these two concepts actually can merge together as you might already be recognizing by simply looking at the slide or you've already been exposed to this concept that the land bank act authorizes counties to establish land banks and that prescribed land bank these powers to acquire control operate manage maintain and improve so if you think about this idea that a land bank property has is eligible um, that it has might be distressed or it's an opportunity for brownfield or redevelopment authorities to come on and help with financing for those activities to prove put those properties to productive reuse, that's the connection that is critical. And frankly, not yet well understood across most of the state because the schools of practice for some time have, has been that the land bank community does its thing and the Brownfield community does its thing and the redevelopment authority group does this thing. But the legislative history behind these two acts clearly demonstrates the intent to link and to for the purpose of broadening and promoting economic development and economic development these time, these days is, in, is understood to include housing development because it has taxable value, it has a generative value and supports uh, business retention and attraction. So why, you might ask, is three, Act 381 a, um, a good solution or a, or a potential a, a solution to help in this matter? Well, 
Here's a few reasons as to why. First, it's scalable, okay? Uh, in other words, a TIFF of a land bank parcel, sometimes we call that a parcel TIFF or even a micro TIFF, meaning within the property itself, can be accomplished through the investment on the property itself. I'm gonna show you a fictitious example where that might in fact be the case, okay? Um, so, uh, and it, as I understood yesterday from Yarrow that there was a really good uh, program run about community land trusts. There's a really interest, interest, in, intricate connection that can happen between land banks, community land trusts, and TIF. And I understood that conversation did happen yesterday in the session. I think it was pretty good. So the idea of being scalable at, on size, on it, geography, that is clear, um, provided you have zoning support uh, and, um, and policy support for doing that. Second is that um, there's a tangible public benefit. Uh, in other words, land banks, and we advocate this to the land bank community, not to go into this willy-nilly. There needs to be a definitive tangible benefit to local, to, to government or to the community in order to engage land banks involvement to get into housing development. Uh, wh where would that be? Attainable, affordable housing development, okay? Or might, might be promoting mixed income development, which generates value to help with attainable, affordable housing development as well. It could be either in ownership, a home ownership structure. That's what you're going to see uh, here we talk about in this presentation and today, but it can also be structured, although it's really uh, um, nascent right now, in a rental structure. Yero and I had a brief conversation where we got started today. We want to explore if the county is want interested and developers to see, uh, help them explore these ideas um, because that is where there's a need to uh, de develop models. It doesn't exist yet. The home ownership model we think is coming into its own in terms of a standard standard practice model. Now across the country, by the way, um, this is not unique. Uh, it's being done in a few areas. For example, New York has an inclusionary housing program which utilizes TIF, their version of TIF. And they have produced uh, about 200 units a year across the city, that's their average. Um, Portland, Oregon, same thing. They have used TIF on a limited scale basis to produce units. Uh, across the states, the only two states that are active in terms of a uh, large scale enabling of this is Maine. Uh, they've been act and they've been active for about five, six years. And the work that's happening here now in Michigan with yourselves, support from the state agencies and such, this is starting to become a, uh, a, a more robust uh, practice, which is, uh, has support in, uh, both in terms of technical, tactical practice across Michigan. So, and I, we expect that there's going to be more uh, practice as this, uh, as this opportunity and the benefit, the tangible public benefits, in addition to providing a tangible affordable, affordable housing is. Okay, so, for the moment, we're gonna dive a little bit into the statutes here, because we know that there's a linkage between the two. Okay, uh, well, what are the linkages? Well, here we go. Uh, if you look at the statutory language in Act 381, you will find that land bank properties, all land bank properties are by definition eligible properties that provided that there would be an activity and uh, investment brought to those properties for those activities. So that's a core uh, benefit, pr pr uh, premise benefit to understand that if you have a land bank property or the land bank co comes to own a property that it is eligible. And what is it eligible for? The entire range of eligible activities under that act, the Act Three, the, the, the Redevelopment Financing Act. I don't show that here today, uh, but I have in the past. It is a wide range of activities, which includes what I've shown in this right side of the slide. This phrase, which is assistance in clearing or quieting title or selling or otherwise conveying. That's where the concept has advanced, which is the, that the sale of a unit or the discount in value or the concession of value in sale of a unit of, that's constructed or rehabilitated upon a land bank property that to a household which is qualified, however that policy or structure gets set up, that that is the, that is the mechanism. I'm going to show it to you again in practice shortly here about or concept concept what it would look like, but that's what we're talking about is that the ability to use TIF or the capture of future taxes paid, paid for by a household to, to generate value to pay for or reimburse extraordinary costs. The extraordinary cost is defined 
not as the cleanup of $200,000 on a brownfield site, but the gap between a household's income be able to more uh, at their maximum mortgage amount, which might be X, and the cost to purchase a unit, which might be X plus Y. It's the Y factor, which the Y amount, which prevents the purchase from happening because of the gaps we just talked about. But if that gap is closed through another source, that sale can happen, that household can purchase that unit. And that at core is the premise of the two tools coming together. So what are the ingredients necessary? We've been talking about a few more already. A willing land bank in a community or an area and a willing brownfield redevelopment authority. And I've said this before, you already know, you have those two uh, ingredients already in place in Leelanau County. Willing land bank, willing brownfield redevelopment authority. Um, next, land bank, or if you look at the statute closely, in certain qualified or what are called core cities, um, mostly larger urban centers, that uh, that if they their property is that that is owned by themselves, that, that would qualify as an eligible property as well. Next, eligible activities with costs. Now we are talking today about that gap between ability to mortgage or the ability to pay a, a, a purchase and the true cost to sell the unit to allow for the production of the unit to occur. Next, the sources of tax revenue. And that's gonna come from the new development value. Think back to the slide I showed you with the graphic, the triangle graphic about TIF, right? Next, a method of financing upfront, the cost of the activities. So if a gap or extraordinary cost amount is $15,000 necessary to make a project happen, that where it's the source of funding that's gonna generate initially the amount of the $15,000, of which the tax capture would repay that and at perhaps as an amortized loan repayment over time, whatever that time period would be. And if you're getting the sense that yes, that's a loan that can fill that gap, you would be correct. That's the principal area. And that's how brownfield projects happen, have been happening for very hard 25 years now since 381 was, uh, was adopted in the law. And finally, the method and calculation for how the revenues would pay off the cost. And in one sentence, that's an intent to show you this is the brownfield plan. This is the, the actual plan that the government, the municipality, the authority, the land bank all participate in so that, they, so that the public can see and it's understood how this whole how, how these mechanics are going to come together uh, to make it go. So those are the five plus critical key ingredients necessary to go. And this is, I'm confident that in Leelanau, you've got those pieces in place right now, almost all of them. Just they just need to come together. And, and start on, uh, on some projects. You can laugh at the gym graphics because I'm never going to advertise myself as being um, an expert here. But again, I'm trying to show you and others in these, in these uh, scenarios, in these presentations, just what this looks like. Again, because showing graphically perhaps has a benefit to, to help you in your mind understand what this looks like. So in a fictitious scenario where a developer produces a house, a house, just that's this baseline scenario. And that cost to sell is $140,000. That means that the developer needs to sell the house and have a profit return to that developer. Because if there's no profit return to that private market developer, there's not going to be a house built. That's pretty straightforward. So if the house cost is $140,000 and the household that approaches to want to purchase that house has a maximum ability to mortgage because of their income level of $120,000, okay? Well, that present, that's a, a nutshell presentation of the problem, one, a core of the problem, which is that you've got households that are making income, they might be Alice households, uh, and uh, they don't, they have income, but they don't have enough income to afford the actual purchase price, to mortgage to afford the purchase price of that house. So where these tools come together, thinking of the ingredients, as I mentioned to you, would be this, that in a scenario that uh, the household itself would still mortgage, they'd still have a first mortgage in this fictitious case uh, of $120,000. They would be repaying that through their income and the security on that loan would be the property, okay? But if a if, if policy and program was created in Leelanau County, which allowed for this to happen, gap financing could come in the form of uh, a, a TIF plan, uh, three, Act 381, redevelopment TIF plan on a land bank owned property where the house is built or rehabilitated. 
there's some nuanced detail about the cash flow to the land bank, okay, which is appropriate. But land banks working in partnership with developers, that's where the action, the activity, the further development of this concept is now progressing. Um, that the um, the that gap is repaid or is is the, the loan I should I should say, which comes from a third party source, a uh, private uh, lender. It could be a nonprofit or or, or uh, um, um, a public lender, a community development financial institution like IFF or others that are across the state are expressing more and more interest into doing these gap loans, or it could be the public entity, maybe the local unit or the authority or some, there's an affordable housing fund. Those dollars could be put in to, for the gap to within which the tax capture and the interest would be generated to pay that back just as if it was a loan with interest over time. The security on that loan would be an approved TIF plan. The government has approved a TIF plan and that has, it has the effect of being a guarantee that if performance is made, meaning house built, purchase, taxes paid, that that will be captured and used to pay. And the second level of security would be a reimbursement agreement that is standard for Act 31 Brownfield or Redevelopment TIF projects across the board. And I, there's no reason that a agreement which guarantees performance cannot be placed on these types, on this type of a project. Okay. Now, one question that might be in your mind on this, which is, does that TIF capture, does that, is, that a, is that binding on the owner of the house, okay? And the quick answer, or, or, or in other words, is the security tied to the owner or to the property? And the response to that would be the security is tied to the property. But of course, the owner in a scenario like this would have to understand and be aware and support the concept that a gap financing loan is coming in to help that, that household purchase a unit. And on a Friday morning, I would tell you, I think for most households, being able to purchase units with assistance like this, I think the answer would be, yeah, there we go. Okay, with it. okay, so where do revenue sources come from? They come from the value of the, of the new or the rehabilitated units, okay? Uh, in, in these two cases, these are houses, these are not TIF projects, but how, new houses built on land bank properties in Grand Rapids. A property value which was zero before with a house built on it has an after value of $140,000 or $70,000 um, taxable value on that. Uh, or townhouses, there are three townhouses there. That other example in that right side example, uh, that's a zero lot value prior because it was owned by land bank. And afterwards, it's $390,000. So as you can see, there is value. There's value which is assessable, there's value which is taxable, there's value which is cap uh, capturable. If a structure, if a con, if a, a, con, a structure was to be organized to do that for projects with units like this, so back to this slide again, or this triangle, because you're familiar with it now. Let's plug in some numbers. Where does the value come from? Well, the base value was zero. I'm showing that here. The new true cash or the sale value of the house was $140,000. That's defining the zero value of base and the $140,000 in new value, which after it's constructed and in the time goes to pay, uh, there'll be inflationary increase on that as well. But we'll just use $140,000 as that yellow triangle increase in value. Uh, 70,000 as the assessed value multiplied by the local millage rate. Now this is not Grand Rapids millage rate, this is fictitious, but if you could plug in a local millage rate on that, that new, uh, SAS taxable value to produce tax revenue, which in this case, fictitious case, is a little under $2,000. And you might think, well, that doesn't go a whole lot to actually cover a gap of $20,000. But TIF plans can go up to 30 years. So it continue to get, or consider that if it's $2,000, just to round up for the moment, over 10 years, that's $20,000. Okay. And that's where the power of the TIF comes, that it doesn't have to be paid up front. It can be actually used as debt service or as payment structure to amortize for another uh, uh, front, front loan, the gap loan that I was describing. So here's a little more detail on that, that TIF dedicated to the second loan. That's what I'm talking about here, right? Um, by the way, the, the, the table on the right is again, it's, it's not tied to the example I just mentioned, but I want to show you in uh, for visual reference what these types of tables look like in redevelopment TIF plans. 
and how they actually are show to calculate uh, costs. So if the gap was $14,000 for that um, project, uh, to, for that gap cost for that house, that it, assuming that the third party lender coming in to cover the gap wanted a 5% interest uh, return on that note, that it can be amortized out to show that in 10 years, that note gets paid. So it's a 10 year gap note. And when that gap note is paid, here's what happens is that the value of that or the equity of the house or the equity that that, that note goes away, the household is actually uh, have the, has the equity. This winds up potentially becoming a wealth generation mechanism for these house, for households as well, which is another benefit of bringing these tools together to help to promote attainable affordable housing. As I mentioned, the Act 3 to one plan is a guarantee. The approval of the government of a plan says, things all in place, we're gonna capture and we're gonna direct funding, funding wherever that agreement says it's gonna go, uh, lender and or otherwise, or through land bank to lender, or through land bank to developer to lender, whatever the structure of that concept, where the activity is gonna be structured there as well. Two items that are important here to think about. I've heard this, we've heard this in questions before. What if, what if the market stagnates in year four? Or what if the market values go down 3% in year five? What then, how does that affect these types of structures? You're gonna get a very little weedy response. The redevelopment TIF law is approving activities with estimated costs. And the effect of a plan approval is that the, 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 co the plan will be in place until the costs of the approved activity and interest if approved are paid. So in the scenario where, scenario where values might stagnate in year four, okay, that means that the plan length or the values uh, go 3% lower in year five or both, uh, that the effect of the plan will be to continue its, uh, its length of time beyond the initially projected 10 years in this example here, perhaps to 12 or 13 years, whatever the new calculation would be, because that is what's necessary to meet the standard of set a reimbursement of the approved at eligible activities and the costs there too. Uh, so it's likely, and I've heard, I've had conversations with a couple lenders, which is their gap, no, gap loan discussions have been that if there's a scenario like that, they probably would bump interest costs up to offset the loss of revenue coming in in a certain year or certain years. And that's okay too, because that can fit within the context of a, of a plan. Okay. Um, I'm going to check the chat for just a minute. Uh, I've got a um, question from Dan Leonard. I'll hit it right now. Would the home then be sold at value that aligns with the AMI at a target range? Curious how the sale asset would be determined. Good question, Dan. All right. So um, the, the, the mechanism we're talking about here now would be silent on that. This would be subject to local policy local uh, program uh, uh, direction of how it wanted to go. In my next thought, this would be absolutely in alignment with what Housing North was talking yesterday with the CLT audience and with those experts. So what I mean by that is that this could be partnered up in a CLT arrangement, which then would have, re not restrictions, but requirements, process and household requirements on sale uh, of those units. Uh, so yes, the answer, well, the answer is not to the, to the mechanism we're talking about at the moment, but in terms of how locals would create and apply policy, those types of, of structures, process structures, Dan, uh, could be entered or could, could, be, could be created. And uh, we would believe, I would believe personally, Land Bank too, is that those, those types of structures should be created because if these houses are, intent, if the homes or units are intended to be uh, uh, developed for affordable units, and they want to have equity generated out of their sale, okay, fine, but uh, there, there needs to be a continuation of preservation of homeownership or affordability and attainability as well. So that's a good question. I appreciate that. And I'll, uh, I'll keep looking at for those uh, questions in the chat if you have them uh, to come. So now thinking through again, the cash flows on this, again, giving you understanding, there's been some confusion in previous conversations about, well, 
mortgage payment or gap loan payment, what does that mean? Well, you got to think of two different streams here, okay? Assuming this all came into place and it was approved, that you as the, the, the homeowner who purchased the house, um, what you'd be looking at, at is your mortgage payment, which is up here on the right. You're going to make your uh, mortgage payment to your loan and it's coming out of your income and your savings, okay? Now, you are paying property tax as well as a homeowner, excuse me. You either might be paying it independent or as part of your mortgage payment. Either way, it's pay being paid. If it's, if it's part of your mortgage payment, it's being collected by the, uh, um, uh, by the third party um, and, and then it's being distributed to, uh, to, the, to the government twice a year for taxes, um, uh, ask the escrow agent and, and going over to, over to them. Um, so going back to this development reimbursement agreement structure, those are the type of me mechanisms in the reimbursement agreement flow, which could be identified and specified so that if I am making a mortgage payment, which includes a portion of property tax to be kept by third party escrow agent, well, the agree de development reimbursement agreement can say, okay, and that pool of money that's collected by the escrow agent can then be directed to the second party mortgager uh, or so the, the, the gap loan. Uh, um, uh, entity for the period of time pursuant to the Brownfield plan and the details follow as such. On the bottom of this slide is where that mechanism that the second lender is taking the TIF revenue and the, which is the property taxes to satisfy the terms of the gap loan. There's a, they might be in parallel, they might be part of the same stream, but it's important to keep them separate in your mind and that it's not an additional burden on the homeowner because they're actually paying taxes in one form or another, independent or as part of their mortgage payment. So that's trying to get you to understand folks so that there's no confusion, no thought that this actually is a burden to anybody else other than directive, uh, direction of dollar flow and such, assuming that uh, the structure set up and approvals are merited for these projects. Okay. Going back to the chats here, let's see. Uh, can a number of years below baseline taxable value be added to 30, 30 year maximum capture period? Well, good question. The, the, the law, Act 3D1 allows technically for a 35 year um, uh, maximum term, and that would be ramp up. This is coming out of the commercial industrial world on these trials, which is you might have a project approved and it needs time to get the full project completion. So uh, you could say 35 years is the maximum period of time um, to, for, for a capture. It's also permitted in under Act 3D1 that authorities and approved plans can capture additional revenue beyond eligible activity costs to, for administrative costs and also to put into reserve fund. That's, I think, and worth another conversation at another time. If, if authority has a reserve fund, if they use it for eligible activities, then that, then that could be done as well. So the idea is that funds could be pooled out of reserve fund to actually either create housing loan, uh, housing, uh, housing loan funds or to supplement or complement. But that, again, that'd be subject to local determination, local policy, local practice, okay? Next question I see coming here is that, is the homeowner paying taxes on the full assessed value, not the lower price? They are paying on the sale value of the unit, okay? Right, so back to the 140, 120 different uh, scenario exam example. They might mortgage at 120, but the sale of the, ho of the house, house was $140,000. So the taxes are gonna be based upon the sale value, well, it's 140, half of that be 70. So that's, the, that's the, the basis for the taxes. Okay. I'm going to move to the next slide now. Keep the questions coming. They're good. I just got to pay attention to uh, um, picking them up. Okay. Now, a $20,000 gap is, is, is achievable, as we've talked about here. You might, in your mind, be thinking, well, in some, with, some, with many households and with many projects, $20,000 doesn't cut it. The gaps could well be much larger than that, right? Agreed. So how could that be addressed? Uh, well, if we understand the concept here now that you could generate taxes if a plan is approved and capture value to help a land bank pass through the land bank to the developer, dot, 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 as we talked about. Well, that tool, that concept then has utility. So it could be moved in different directions. Here's a way it could be moved. 
which is another fictitious example. In this case, it's six units. We're building six houses, or it's a six unit townhouse, whatever, six unit project. And three of those units, uh, there are, uh, we wanna make offer to, to the household, but those households that are either coming in door, in the, into the door, or we are preparing for households that have a $10,000 gap for the first unit, $20,000 gap on the second unit, $50,000 gap on the third unit, or any combination that you might think, but in this case, it's $80,000 total gap. First glance is if it's only three units, then it's gonna have a hard time, might have a hard time covering that gap cost in the time allotment necessary or permitted under a plan uh, to do this. However, you gotta keep in mind, and I didn't mention this until now, that a brownfield plan on a project is, can be the subject parcel and adjacent and contiguous properties that comprise the project. So the scenario that could avail here is that if a developer were to perhaps make a decision that we're gonna do six, in this six unit project and three of the units will be affordable, attainable, but the other three are gonna be market rate. What happens then is something interesting, which is that those market rate units, which do not need uh, um, subsidy, but will continue that can be captured and there the value of their capture can be brought in in combination with the units that are going to be uh, needing subsidy to actually build higher levels of subsidy to cover larger gaps. So the idea here in this scenario is that there's a six unit project and three of them are going to be affordable attainable with the $80,000 subsidy and the entire project is able to cover this gap in 14 years. All right, or whatever combination would be identified. What this, what I'm getting at is that this tool in another, another approach can be used as a mixed income de housing delivery tool, which perhaps is not only financially beneficial, but it's also socially beneficial and community beneficial for many reasons. You can imagine what those reasons would be that you can generate deeper gaps. It can have better spread and mix of units, households across the community. Um, and, uh, and it can um, uh, not have um, some of the unintended consequences that, that some of the programs have had in funding affordable housing, which is a tendency to concentrate sometimes uh, or, or any other combination. And in addition to all that, if non-residential project or uh, a value was brought into a project, let's assume it was a corridor on a main street or, or in a neighborhood, which could or was design-wise appropriate for commercial first story and one or two stories of residential upper uh, or there's some other combination that that uh, non-residential value is also accessible, taxable, capturable. So it, the flexibility of this starts to come, I think, into view as you think about this. Once the basic construct of a capture of value for the base activity, which is the housing subsidy through the land bank to the uh, to, uh, to the developer, uh, works. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. As I said, the Euro before we started, we actually created a a, a, a training uh, program. I'm showing you some of those slides today, not all of them. Uh, to actually help people who aren't familiar with TIF understand how TIF plans actually come together. Uh, and there's a playbook that's being generated by the Economic Open Association folks, which will hopefully be published after, uh, well, after a month or so and be available as well. So these, some of these concepts are coming right out of that presentation and that, uh, in that, in that training. Um, so I'm not gonna get too deep into this, but it's really, you can think of it almost as a task line, okay? In other words, if you get the mechanics set up, the willing land bank and brownfield authority, perhaps local lenders willing to step in to do gap loans, a uh, uh, one or more parties, uh, local parties willing to kind of be part of your local housing coalition, like you already have in Leelanau County and a number of other communities in Northwest Lower Region 2. Then you've got the ability to actually create, perhaps create a production task line, which has these major stages to it. First is developing the approach. This is the far left which is you have, a, you have one or more developers. You take a proactive approach. It could be the municipality or the land bank in partnership with those developers doing that work as well. And understand and learn and create models. Create the model of how you wanna proceed with these types of projects. Next is to organize who, those partners. I put in circle your Brownfield Authority. They are a key component here, uh, as you already know. How you structure 
not just the brownfield plan or the 3D1 process, but the process leading up to plan and after plan as well. And how those resources plug in. Next is what sites, if it's a site to start or whether it, you think of it's more of as going into a production mode, what are the site supply options that are in pipeline potentially that could come to you and organize around that. Then the formulation of what the actual projects look like, whether you have developers in tow right now or whether you have to solicit developers. And then after that, what is the what are the costs and revenues, which in feasibility analysis is going to yield that cost sale gap, which we've been talking about in this presentation. And then those are all almost preparatory activities to the execution of activities, which include the plan, entitlement, execution, and management. If you can think of how that goes as a pipeline system or a task line system, it is feasible to actually develop a uh, production system even down to small community level, like Leo County. This slide uh, is a little bit dated. We haven't been able to update this yet, um, but what you're looking at here was the status of community interest uh, as of, I'll say, early 2020. So um, you can um, imagine, and it is and it's true, that some communities have, have plateaued. They have been not active beyond where they have been here uh, because of pandemic. Um, and now the result of the, uh, the uh, uh, material and cost uh, supply chain problems that are related to the pandemic. Those have had a large effect now at the present time. But what I can tell you off this list is that we know right now, just off the top of my head, five communities that are not only active, but they have actually done projects. Uh, Muskegon, Grand Haven, Flint, Nuego, and Holland. Uh, not the, the municipalities or their authorities have been involved, but the projects have been done by developers with land banks in partnership in each of those communities. And that's how it has proceed, proceeded. So that active list is gonna continue to grow, we think, as we start to cross fingers and hope we move out of the pandemic and we actually move back to more normalized supply chain on, and, la and labor, labor supply for the markets. But let me talk to you, show you briefly what some of these uh, active successful projects have been. The first real commu first community that really came out uh, really active was a Muskegon. They adopted a plan in 2020. Um, I've tried to highlight this for you. They have 240 lots. I think that's the number. Uh, and they applied their scare, a scatter site 381 plan to redevelop infill these sites on this concept. Uh, now, Muskegon is not working with a land bank, but they're operating under that pro proviso excuse me, that a qualified or core community local unit ownership of their property can do this as well. That's Muskegon. They were the first community that really were at, was active and that got a lot of, uh, got a lot of press coverage and a lot of interest by the community. So right after that, Nuevo, uh, now this is a project that uh, it, the state land bank was involved with because Nuevo County does not have a land bank. So Nue the city of Nuevo came to us with a developer. In this case, it was a private developer who was having difficulty uh, uh, with his units, uh, mostly because he had high infrastructure and high um, uh, site prep costs because of the grades and issues on the site, but that yielded house prices, which were higher than what the market could afford. So we did engage with them. We ran the, a process program with them. This phase two of uh, North River Hills Estates is now under construction uh, or started construction late in the fall. And the average subsidy across the 16 units is going to be about $18,000. Now that subsidy is not direct subsidy to the household. It's translated through in reduced cost of sale because the reimbursement of infrastructure and site preparation activities is what's in that brownfield plan. But it's effectively the same. It's a reduction in cost, which allows, allows them to meet the market, market, market price. This project, which is in construction as well, it's in Holland, uh, Allegan County, uh, part, of, part of Holland. Uh, is um, uh, was a property a project which the state land bank was requested to come and participate in, um, uh, as I've been describing in this whole presentation. Um, the interesting thing to note here is that the developer here is Habitat for Humanity, which opens the door. If you've been thinking about this, which is can nonprofits do this work? Well, the quick answer is yes. If the result of your production work is going to be accessible, taxable, capturable, or accessible, taxable units. If that's the case, then they're capturable. So this, we believe, and what we've been starting to see is becoming a, a high level of interest amongst the small developer community, including Habitat affiliates, 
what we like to say is the small developer, small community, small project uh, audience seems to see seeing seeing good merit in doing these projects. And we all the more better because, as you know, we, as many units that we need to get built affordable, attainable is what's on tap. We need to do that. Okay. Um, just a couple of slides left. Uh, we have additional resources. Uh, the state land bank itself. Uh, we uh, have had a housing development loan for a couple of years now. Um, and that's available to land banks, uh, county land banks, and local units working with their county land banks. Uh, so if you have an interest, Leelana and our other communities, uh, and want to talk to us about that, yeah, we'd be interested to talk to you. Now, they're simple loans. The idea behind those loans is money up front to get the project going to be taken out. And as the project is finally is finalized and approved to go. Why? Why? Because that could be picked up in a subsequent loan, whether it's the principal drama loan or whether it's a gap loan to be, to be done. So there's that as well. But we also opened up last fall uh, at, in the new fiscal year, a pilot program where we are, in, we are preparing, we are prepared to uh, provide pre-development um, investment dollars um, direct into projects up to 10,000. Uh, you may have seen that advertisement out. But we can we are interested to play that role as well, um, and of course we have we have done this. We're still uh, at any time we'll take application or take request to consider holding land. You can think of it almost like a temporary escrow type of arrangement, holding it to help properties go, like what we did with um, with um, um, habitat there, lakeshore habitat in um, uh, in Holland. Right. Okay, so I am done with the pres material. And I'm ready to year to go into Q and A. But what I want to do is I want to set up the Q and A with a couple of prep questions. So kind of get these out of the way because they're pretty important. We've had a little bit of conversation about them, uh, um, about some of them, but some of them I think are have been I'll call them long-standing policy concerns that maybe have been out there in local units of government or, re or regional units of government on TIF because TIF has a history in Michigan goes back 50 years, 40 years, excuse me, back to last century. And um, uh, there, there's a lot of good, but there's also been some issues or concerns that have arisen over time. So I wanna cover these first. First question, Jim to Jim is, number one, isn't uh, Act 3 one like the other TIFs? The answer to that is no. If you're familiar with DDAs or LDFAs or corridor CIAs, uh, or any other A's out there, and your community might have them. Those are what we would call district TIFs, district tax and refinancing authorities. They operate within a defined district, and they do a whole range of activities in those districts, and that's how they've been going, and they have been going and been going and going, okay? Pro redevelopment TIF, or Brown for redevelopment TIF, as I've been describing today, is unique. It's a project or parcel-based TIF. It's been that way since the beginning. My personal opinion is that that's why it's had political interest and political support is because it's a limited term, returns properties to tax rolls, and if structured correctly, covers or reimburses extraordinary costs and nothing more. And that's how that that's what, that's why it's been successful in my opinion. But it's distinct and from the district tips. So keep that in mind as you think about the TIF world and how this approaches. Next big policy question. Does TIF take away money from schools and locals? There have been discussions and analysis and research about district TIFs that have uh, 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 that, that state that, and that could be the case. In redevelopment TIF, in a current TIF, the quick answer is no, it does not. Provided that extraordinary cost is the critical delimiter, that it's nothing, not more than the interest on that and such, but it's focused on the recovery or re re reimbursement of extraordinary costs. And in the land bank structure setting, it's especially the case. Why? Because land bank properties, how much do they pay to, to, to schools and locals? Zero. They've usually come in through foreclosure in, into inventory or they are otherwise funky properties and they don't pay anything at present time. And chances are they're probably pulling down values in neighborhoods in certain communities. So in, if anything, bringing TIF, project-based TIF to a land bank site, housing or otherwise, is gonna have two benefits, three benefits. It's gonna redevelop that site. 
it's going to bring new value after the incentive incentive uh, redevelopment is is constructed or is developed and operating. And third, as opposed to a drain, it's actually a long-term fiscal benefit advantage to local communities and the schools. The third question is, how can this be protected from abuse? Um, and the answer to that is, it's entirely de 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 devised to local policy, local guidance on, on this. It would be our strong opinion that things like how you control land sales, like what we heard in the previous question, would be appropriate. Uh, for local policy, local program development to occur. And there could be a bunch you know, other areas that would be part of your local programs, your guidance, your policy, if you want to or are prepared to or decide to proceed with developing a program utilizing these tools. Now those are, I wanna get those out of the way. I wanna go back to the Q and A as I, um, uh, or maybe you already seen it, Yarrow. I know that saw one there. Uh, okay. It's uh, Trudy, you mentioned earlier, it's important to have a policy program with gap finance in place. If examples of these documents are they using other communities to be shared? Great question. And the answer today is no, do not. This, we're at a nascent stage uh, in, uh, in this work and I'm not aware of any, any that have been created. I would be interested to keep that question live if not today into, into the short-term future and maybe have some, uh, uh, work conversation and uh, discussion work with Housing North and a few other, of other interested players to want to actually perhaps develop some stat standard guidelines. Um, we're just we're just really nascent in the in the in the start of this work um, and this deserves. So that's a great question, uh, and I think the answer is going to come in uh, in time. Uh, I think that's it for the questions on chat. I went off the presentation arrow. I'm going to turn the floor back to you to facilitate any other questions. Thanks, Jim. Um... So I don't think there are, I don't have any questions specifically uh, lined up, but I did see one more just came in. Okay, this is from John uh, Wallace. Can you recap how a city can use this process when there is no county land bank? Yeah, good question. Um, you get, in, in effect, you can think, uh, uh, John and City of Cadillac, that the state land bank is your county land, is your land bank, okay? Uh, we're not taking, uh, properties under foreclosure. Um, I think, I, um, if I'm not mistaken, I think Wexford County does for is a foreclosure county. So your treasurer is um, uh, is taking those properties and you're putting them out. She's put or he or she are putting them out the auction. Okay, but for all other practical purposes, the state land bank is your land bank. And so these mechan these mechanisms can come to play. Um, it's simply, I mean, I'm being simple for the moment. It would be insert state land bank in the place of county land bank. And we'll be happy to help you now. As we do that, and we've done this in a few other communities, what we have, we've done is brought in county people, county representatives, and we've asked them, we would like to help if you want to consider structuring for or formulating a land bank, we'll help you do that so that this can be your project or you can learn in, a pro, in an initial project and then be able to proceed. That is happening right now in Shiawassee County where they haven't had a land bank until recent. And one of the purposes of their land, their formation land bank is to do development redevelopment projects. And so they are interested, we don't, we're, we're working a project in Owasso right now. It's not ready to go. We've got some time to hold here, but that's going to have a benefit of being a kind of a on the job or on the spot training activity for Shiawassee County. Um, and we have interest in a few other counties, but they haven't pulled the trigger yet to want to say, okay, let's get started. We're going to form and now we want to have a relationship with you. So uh, in Wexford, we're your land bank and we'll be prepared to talk with you. Uh, thanks, Jim. I just, uh, a question came in on the Q&A about where they can, people can find recorded uh, webinars and other information. And so we have a YouTube channel, Housing North. If you just Google Housing North YouTube, you can find it there. But I will send a follow-up email to all of those who registered with a PDF of Jim's presentation and then a link to the recorded session. Um, I did just want to ask one thing, Jim, and you're, you may not be able to speak to this, but yesterday, one of the uh, points of the presentation that Denny uh, was proposing as a partnership with Community Land Trust in this tool was to extend that repayment period, you know, out quite, quite a bit longer than some of the scenarios you proposed. Have you seen any projects in your experience that, that use that maybe going out 30 years or, or that have, um, can you speak to that at all? 
I can speak to it briefly with a quick response of no, right now, I have not seen that with the housing subsidy projects with TIF. Um, once again, I, I might start to sound broken record like, but because we're so nascent on this, uh, with this, with this work and these, in the, in these to this tool combination, I think I have, there hasn't been enough practice time yet to see that. In other areas of redevelopment TIF financing, the more typical or classic brownfield or functionally obsolete properties, I have seen scenarios where money is loaned out to cover extraordinary costs, particularly public money, and it has a low interest rate uh, or a no interest rate, and it has a long-term repayment because the, the gap source itself is intended to be an incentive to help the project. It could be that that could be negotiated with appropriate public or nonprofit entity that's providing gap loan. It, I just have we just haven't seen it yet in the housing context. Okay, now two questions just came in. Um, so, uh, it, can land banks acquire a property to utilize for the redevelopment TIF? This is just a clarification. And additionally, could the land bank receive a property in escrow to use for this TIF? Yeah, good question. So. Technically, under the under the act, under the land bank act, land banks can acquire properties by any means. Um, the standard uh, practice and understood practice is that land banks acquire properties out of foreclosure. However, land banks can acquire property in any way, and we have state land bank, and we have are aware of other land banks uh, who have proactively acquired property for the purpose of helping that property get prepared for TIF uh, assistance for housing subsidy or for other activities as well. That is technically permitted. There is um, guidance uh, which would preclude those types of projects from being submitted for school tax capture. Um, and, it's, and there's good reason for that. It's intended to uh, prevent a usurpation of the system to advantage a project just for the sake of advantaging a developer. But the type of work we're doing here doesn't meet that criteria. And our, as when we apply a response to requests from us for proactive land banking or proactive acquisition, we apply very strictly the public benefit, the tangible public benefit standard. We are requesting a local unit of government to support the project and petition to us with a letter and to demonstrate to us the, what they feel is the tangible public benefit. And we then make discretionary decision on how and if we're going to participate in that case. Now, one of the final point to that question, under Act 31, land banks, a land bank's acquisition of property is also an eligible activity. That has been rarely used. But we have seen opportunities where that could be used, and I could theoretically see it be an opportunity to use in an affordable or attainable housing situation. But keep in mind, I just said that it's the theoretical. I haven't seen anything in practice yet. Thanks, Jim. Um, one other question is about what um, services, sort of consulting services or technical support there might be for developers uh, to, to navigate this. Yeah, that's a good, another good question. It, bring, it reminds me to bring back something I mentioned briefly. Um, uh, there is a, uh, a group of uh, organizations, uh, I call them housing, affordable housing experts, um, uh, or, uh, and they're being led by the Economic Developers Association. Quick sidebar, the Economic, MEDA, the Economic Developers Association is very engaged in this. And the reason they have been engaged for now two years and driving a project, I'll explain the project in a minute, uh, is because they see the nexus between attainable, affordable housing supply and the ability in local economic developers to be able to service their, their business clients for retention and attraction projects. That is a top three issue in the economic development world here in Michigan, meaning the uh, business attraction retention projects are, are, are happening, but housing support, housing supply for employees, those new employees, or existing in community employees is a top three issue, which of which has driven the economic development industry and the practitioners to get active here because they see it as a mutual benefit across all of them, uh, or across the, 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 the two sectors. So MEDA uh, is leading a process or program with a number of other um, state organizations, Habitat, uh, Michigan is involved with that. Um, there's a number of others there to develop what's being called a playbook. 
meaning uh, it's a it's 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 a it can be electronic guidance book for practitioners, developers, community officials, and such to better understand this and get prepared or get ready or even start to st structure up how they would organize and do projects in communities. Uh, it's been about nine months in, in uh, work. Um, uh, there's been a lot of partners involved. I'm confident that we'll probably have a draft, final draft within uh, 30 days, and it could be disseminated as early as March um, uh, in time for, they, for their program in March. But um, of course, uh, of course, here, you know, Housing, Housing North has been a participant in that work and a number of other good providers have been there as well. So we'll be relying upon, I think, uh, all, the, provide, all the, the key players across the state to actually have this guidebook, it'll be free. It'll be on the electronic, so put it on websites and be able for it to be to be picked up and read and understood. And we hope that that's going to help all segments out in the market they get a better understanding and be able to start to mobilize. Thanks, Jim. Um, I see one last question uh, came in. Um, if a land bank housing project involves both eligible costs and purchase gap loan, what gets reimbursed first? Um, it would be to the decision and discussion between the land bank and the redevelopment authority uh, as to how that gets covered. Um, I'm being uh, um, kind of generic on that right now because these are purely local decisions that are going to be made. Um, I might have an opinion, but it, that it matters not because if I am the Leland All Land Bank, well, if, let me step in, Trudy, for a minute. Don't laugh too hard. But I'm, if I'm Leland Land Bank, uh, and there's a site that does have those two cross purpose or cross eligible activities, um, then the discussion is what is appropriate either in policy generally or on site specific for those activities. So, some type of discussion, negotiation, arrangement will have to come into play. That's that's the quick answer. And it's going to be a local determination, and perhaps it's an element that would go into a local policy or local guidance. Going back to what we said and I talked said earlier, it's critical if you get into this work, so beneficial, but to be in this work, have guidance so that all parties understand what the guideposts are, what the railings are, and how they can actually be efficient to produce for them and be a benefit. Great, so maybe just to close, I know, um... This is was kind of uh, came about because Leelanau County was interested in learning more. But are you available for other communities if they do want to have you come specifically speak, you know, to their um, county commissioners or elected officials to learn more or other groups? And um, what do you think the next step would be to kind of line line those uh, opportunities up? Yeah, good one there, Giro. And I, uh, uh, we are ready and willing and excited to want to have conversation and discuss and present to any audience uh, about the, how these tools can work together. We would be really interested, uh, you know, you and I have talked a number of times uh, in perhaps uh, uh, working collaboratively with Housing North because um, we're folks in Lansing, Michigan. Uh, and we really like to work with local partners because you know your audiences, you know your communities. Yeah, you know, I get around to the state, but you guys know your audiences. So if, if, if desired, we'd be interested to facilitate that type of communication connection and scheduling with Housing North and with other regional or local housing providers who are, might be in this webinar today. If, if you are not in Northwest lower region and you want to uh, have a discussion about how to ramp up or amp up uh, discussion, presentation, detailing on this, um, you can reach me. Uh, I think uh, the presentation is down, but uh, we'll have, I'll leave my contact information uh, with Yarrow and um, you can reach out anytime we are. Uh, we have a, a comms and a PR uh, structure that can respond and organize, um, and we'll be happy to do that because this is. We feel this is part of our mission. Great. Well, thanks, Jim. I know I will be in touch with you uh, regularly, and um, thank you all for attending. Again, I'll send out a follow up email with a link uh, to our YouTube channel to Jim's presentation and then his contact information. So, uh, thank you all. Be safe this weekend, um, and we'll be in touch. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks for your time.